right, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast with us. For some of you, I know it's your first time ever joining us, in which case, hi, I'm Jesse. Welcome to the program. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We do 40-plus broadcasts every single month featuring the coolest scientists and explorers on planet Earth, and everything we do goes to our YouTube channels. If you want to check out programs from like three weeks ago, three years ago, you can head there, do just that, share this one with your family and friends. Lots of fun opportunity to keep the learning going. Now today, before I dive in with our specific speaker, oh, you guys are in for such a treat today, I want to note we are going to have a Kahoot together. So four quick questions, test your understanding, have a little bit of fun. You win our everlasting respect. If you want to pull that up in a separate tab, I really encourage you to do that now. Uh, I will share that again and for our YouTube friends as well. Now, as many of you know, this is our space month. We have been featuring, we just wrapped up with Terry Virts, astronaut, like a minute and a half ago. We've had other astronauts on this month. We've had a whole variety of amazing NASA, Canadian Space Agency, and more personnel. Everything's on our YouTube channel. It's been a really wild ride to the outer reaches of our cosmos. But today, we are bringing on one of the most energetic, enthusiastic, and captivating speakers we ever have on the program, Kevin J. DeBruin. He is an American Ninja Warrior. He is a personal trainer. He's an Eagle Scout, uh, an incredible guide to the cosmos and universe. He is an author. He has the he's a curiosity stream space expert. He's really done everything. I don't know if he sleeps at all. We can ask him that in the Q&A at the end, but I'm so excited to have him back on to blow all your minds and highlight all the amazing stuff happening in the world of space right now. It's the coolest time to be interested in space ever. And you're in for a wild ride with Kevin. So Kevin, thank you so much for joining us again, man. And welcome back. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I look forward to this every single year. It's like October's coming up. All right, let's do this thing. Space month, let's do it. Well, I know you've got a lot to share with us. So if you want to dive right in, let's bring it up. Let's do this thing and uh, get underway. Oh, yeah, let's do it. All right. I'm going to share my screen and show you some cool things. We'll ask some questions. I'll tell you that I don't sleep. I don't believe in sleep. It's not actually a thing. <laughs> I any more coffee. So... <laughs> Oh, dear. All right. Coffee's the best. I, I'm a big coffee fan. And our kids are like a few, maybe a decade away from that, really get, getting into it. But you'll appreciate it when you're our age. It's very exciting. There we go. Yes. How's it look, everyone? You are good to go. It looks beautiful, man. Take us away. All right. Beautiful. All right. Like Jesse said, my name is Kevin Jada Bruin. So what you're looking at here is one of the NASA centers. There are more than 20 different NASA centers and facilities all across the United States of America. And this one is outside of Los Angeles, California, and it's known as the Jet Propulsion Lab. That's uh, JPL for short. We just call it NASA JPL. And the Mars rovers, they all get built and designed right here in these buildings. That's where I was working. And I'm going to tell you all about a special mission that we are launching next October to a place called Europa that's being built inside of those buildings right now. So Jesse told you a little bit about who I am. I'm literally a rocket scientist. I know how to design spaceships. They've had astronauts on before. I, I am not an astronaut yet. I want to go to space, working on it. But right now, I just designed the spaceships to take people and robots to other places. So not an astronaut yet, just a rocket scientist. But my actual title at NASA was a systems engineer. And my job was being responsible for integrating the spacecraft. So you think of spacecrafts, they've got so many different parts and pieces. My job is to make sure it all comes together correctly. And not just like piece A fits into piece B, but you've got to think about power. Does everything get, is everything getting the power that it needs? Are some pieces drawing too much power and we need to make sure that we have enough to spread around the system? Is there data going back and forth? We're collecting all this information about planets and moons and other stars. Can we store all that on our onboard computer? And then like uh, Jesse also said, I'm an American Ninja Warrior and an Eagle Scout. So you may have seen me on that TV show if you watch that one flying around and maybe falling in a couple pools. All right. Why I became a NASA rocket scientist was I saw this movie, October Sky, when I was 10 years old. And I knew I wanted to design spaceships for NASA. Now, this movie is based on a real true story. And it's based on the book Rocket Boys, written by Homer Hickam. That's the guy you see on the right-hand side there. He saw Sputnik, the first artificial satellite, going across the night sky. And it looked like a, a star just moving across. And he got so inspired. Him and his friends built rockets, eventually winning a science fair, went on and became a NASA engineer training astronauts. And they turned that story into a movie. And I saw it when I was a little kid. 
And I knew that's what I wanted to do. So it took me a while to get there, but it is, I'd like to share this part because school can get hard, right? Sometimes homework is tough, tests, exams, you don't do so well, or there's a lot of stuff on there and it's really difficult. I would get discouraged or I'd get sad or tired. I'm like, oh, school. But I would rewatch this movie and it reminded me why I'm doing this. Everything that I'm learning right now and that I'm going to learn is going to help me be able to design spaceships and send stuff into outer space and maybe go there one day myself. So I would reread this book or rewatch the movie over and over again when tests were coming up or school got a little hard just to keep that motivation going. Now, when I was 10 years old, I was watching this movie. This is what I looked like back then. It wasn't that long ago that I was in your seats trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, right? I'm like, I, you know, being a firefighter sounds kind of cool. Maybe a professional basketball player. I don't know, maybe I want to be a singer, songwriter. But then I saw that movie and I was like, okay, this is it. So I grew up, I went through eighth grade and I had to go on to high school and then college. I went all the way up to the 19th grade. Yeah, that's a, a long time. I don't have a PhD, so I'm not Dr. Kevin. I have my master's in aerospace engineering. So I went to the 19th grade to make that happen. And then I got my job at NASA. So speaking of NASA, let's actually talk about space now. This is a representation of our solar system. It's a lot bigger than this and things are a lot more spaced out. But we see our eight planets here. We've got our sun in the center of our solar system. Then we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Now, where do you think the best place is to look for life other than us, you know, on Earth, in our solar system? Is it the sun? Maybe one of the closer planets, Mercury, Venus? Ooh, Mars, we're sending robots there all the time, right? Maybe that's a really good place. And Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune? Hmm. There are so many places we could go look for life. Where's the best place to look for that? It's a place called Europa. Well, Europa is not one of the planets. So what is it? Well, it's a moon. But where? Earth has one moon. Mercury has no moons. Venus has no moons. Mars has two. Jupiter has like 90. Saturn has over 100. Uranus and Neptune have around between 10 to 15. So there are moons all over our solar system. Way more than just the one moon we have here at Earth. So where is Europa? Well, Jupiter. If we zoom in on Jupiter, we see its four biggest moons here. They're known as the Galilean moons. We have Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Galileo Galilei pointed his telescope to the night sky back in 1610, over 400 years ago. And what he saw was a little solar system inside of our own solar system. Now, this was crazy at the time because we... Everyone on Earth thought that we were the center of the universe. But how could we be the center of the universe if there are things orbiting something else? So it totally changed our way of thinking. And we saw this mini solar system. Now, Io is the most volcanically active body in our solar system. It has more volcanoes than anything else out there. And we just took a picture of Io last week with one of our spacecrafts called Juno, and we could actually see a little volcano erupting on its south pole. That's super neat. So we want to send a spacecraft there someday to check out those volcanoes. Europa. We're going to really dive into that one in a little bit. So we're going to skip over it and go to Ganymede. Now, Ganymede is the largest moon in our solar system. Yeah, it's even bigger than the planet Mercury. If it wasn't around Jupiter, it could possibly be its own planet. But Jupiter is so big, it grabbed it, brought it in, and made it one of its own moons. Now, Callisto. Callisto is one of the oldest, if not the oldest object in our solar system. How do we know that? Well, you see there's a lot of shiny white spots all over it. Almost kind of looks like a golf ball with all the dents. Well, there's a scientific word for counting those dents to figure out how old something is. And that's called crater dating. You count up the craters, and the more craters it has, the longer it's been around. So the more you're floating around, the longer you're here in the solar system, the more time and more of a chance for things to run into you, tiny little micro meteorites, you know, rocks coming in. So the more dense you have, the older you are. And that's what we see with Callisto. Now, Jupiter has 
I think we're at 93, maybe 95 or 97 moons. It's hard to keep track because we're finding new moons every so often. Every couple of couple of months, we have a new count for the moons. And that's because we collect all of this data from spacecraft. It takes a really long time to go through it. So we have data sitting in libraries that scientists are going through and identifying more and more moons as time goes on. All right, Europa. We were talking about life outside of Earth, which is aliens. So Europa is the best place to look for aliens in our solar system. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you all about Europa. So it kind of looks like a blue marble a little bit with some red spots on it. Now, those red spots could be the volcano eruption after effects from the moon Io. As it's passing through the orbits of Jupiter, we might actually be grabbing some of that volcanic eruption. We don't know yet because we haven't been on the surface and we haven't been close enough to test. So we're going to look for that when we get out there. Europa is about the size of our moon here on Earth, but it has about two to three times as much water as all of Earth. Wait, how is that possible? It's like so much smaller than Earth, but it has more water than Earth? Yes. So yes, Earth's oceans cover like 70% of our surface, but on average, the oceans are only about four kilometers deep, with our deepest part being in the Mariana Trench, a place called the Challenger Deep, at 11 kilometers. Now, Europa, we believe, has a global ocean. So that means an ocean all over it underneath an icy crust that's about 100 kilometers deep. Yeah, so we have an icy crust that's maybe 20 to 30 kilometers. Underneath that, a 100 kilometer deep ocean, then a rocky mantle and an iron core. So we think it is the best place to look for aliens because of the ingredients for life as we know it. The ingredients for life are water, chemistry, and energy. We call this habitability. Does it have the right conditions or the right environment, the right setting, like the outside, to potentially host a life? So for life as we know it, those are the three things we need. We need water. If you take a spoon and you go out to a river, you go out to a lake, go to the ocean, just take a spoonful of water, there are hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of microorganisms inside just that spoonful of water. So Europa has a salty water ocean. So we can check that box. We know it's got the water. Where we find water on Earth, we find life. So when we're looking for life elsewhere in the solar system and the universe, we look for water. Okay. Next up, chemistry. We need the building blocks of life. These are the things we find in rocks. Things like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. C-H-N-O-P-S. You could say it, schnapps. That's how I remember all of those. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. We're looking for all of those elements in the right combination of molecules to give us life. So as we are carbon-based life forms, that's a C. You know, we drink and need H2O. H2O, that's water. You know, we breathe oxygen. So all of those things are what we're looking for. And from what we can tell, it seems that Europa has the potential to have all of those. We haven't found all of them yet, but we've detected it has a good amount of them. Now, energy. We need a way to power life. Here on Earth, we have this giant light in the sky, a ball that looks like fire, but it's nuclear fusion happening. And that gives off light and heat and energy. So here on Earth, the plants use the light for photosynthesis. They do that, and then the, the plants are able to survive. Animals eat the plants, we eat the plants, and we eat some animals that also eat the plants. So the sun is the driving force of energy for life here on Earth. But out at Jupiter, it's five times further away than Earth is from the sun. So we are looking for life inside that ocean. So the sunlight isn't strong enough to go through that ice and to power photosynthesis all the way out there. So when we send a spacecraft with solar panels, they are huge. They are the biggest solar panels we've ever built to try and just power our tiny little robot spacecraft. So if we're looking for life, we need something else for energy. Now, remember how I said Jupiter has like 90 some moons right now, and we showed you the four biggest ones, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto? Well, Io, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto all push and pull on each other with their gravities as they're going around Jupiter's orbit. 
So they're pushing and pulling on each other. Everybody make a fist, okay? Make a fist hole in front of you and then open it up a little bit and close it. Open it up a little bit and close it. So that's what's happening as the other one push and pull on Europa. They push it and it gets small. They pull it. Europa gets a little bit bigger and then they push it again and it shrinks kind of. So those lines we see on Europa, that's the ice cracking from it getting a little bit bigger and a little bit smaller. It's pushing and pulling on it. Like if you were to make a snowball, you can squeeze the snowball and like it'll crack and get smaller. That's what happens. And then the gravity also then pulls it back. So it's going back and forth. So all of this movement creates energy. Everyone put your hands together in front of you and rub them together up and down really, really fast, really, really fast. What do you feel? You got warm. There's heat. So that movement causes friction, which creates heat. And that's energy. So the moon's pushing and pulling on each other, cause that movement, cause the friction, creates heat to help maintain that liquid saltwater ocean and make things that are we see in that bottom left, right-hand corner image, underwater volcanoes. We call them like black smokers or chimneys. We see these down on our ocean floor here on Earth. That's where that picture is from. And we find life down there. But the light doesn't reach all the way down there. So what? We'll what do they use for their metabolism like the plants? Well, it's chemical energy. So light is photosynthesis because photo is light. Well, chemical energy down there uses chemosynthesis, chemical energy for their metabolism, for them to live. So we think that that process is going out at Europa and we want to go and see if that's true to see if we can find the aliens. So we found that there are also plumes. Actually, I got a video here. Hopefully it's clear for you as it comes through. So this is just an animation. The Hubble Space Telescope was taking pictures of Europa and we found little plumes. So this is like water volcanoes, ice volcanoes shooting out of the ice. Because remember, as Europa is getting bigger and smaller, the ice is cracking and then the ocean shoots out of those cracks. So if we want to detect aliens in the ocean, we might not have to go into the ocean. We might just be able to go through one of these plumes, kind of like a geyser. Or if you've ever seen a fire hydrant that accidentally got knocked over, all the water shooting up in the air, that is what we think is going on in Europa. So we can go grab some of that water and see if there's aliens in it. Now, I know you're like, aliens fitting inside water? We're not looking for like E.T. aliens or like the aliens we see in Star Wars or Avengers. We're talking about tiny little microbes, tiny little organisms like the size of bacteria. That's the life that we're looking for out there. So we designed and are currently building this spacecraft called Europa Clipper. Those big wings on the side, those are the solar panels. So they attract the sunlight and then they use that sunlight for energy that big disc on the top, the circle, that's our antenna, our telephone, so we can talk to the spacecraft from Earth. And it is being built inside those buildings that I showed you when we first started out in Los Angeles, California. They're putting it together right now. And we're going to launch it next October. So in less than a year, our launch window opens. It's the 23rd right now. We have a launch window on October 13th, 2024 is when we're looking to launch it. So less than a year, we're going to launch the spacecraft out to Jupiter. And this is what it's going to look like when it gets there. On the left-hand side, you see that line going around? That is tracing the spacecraft's orbit around Jupiter. It's doing a long looping orbit. It's going to come in and fly by Jupiter about seven, eh, not about 42 to 45 times over the course of two and a half years. On the right-hand side, all of those lines you see, I'm going to play this again for us. On the right-hand side, all of those white lines around Europa is where the spacecraft is flying by. Now, we're orbiting Jupiter and flying by Europa because the radiation environment at Europa is really intense. And spacecrafts or electronics do not like radiation. So we only want to be in the normal radiation of space. And then we come in close to Europa, which is closer to Jupiter. And we hustle through for about 10 hours to collect our science. And then we get back to the normal radiation of space. You could think of Jupiter like a giant microwave. You do not put metal in the microwave. You're not supposed to do that, but it gets like hot and crazy. So Jupiter's like a microwave. We don't want our spacecraft to be in there too long. So we go in real quick and then we come up and we cool down. 
Now, every one of those white lines on the right looks like this. As the spacecraft comes in, these different colored bars turning on are different science instruments. We have an ice penetrating radar. This blue and purple is a camera taking high resolution images of the surface. We have spectrometers looking at this. We have thermal imagers. We have topographic imagers. And then as we get further away, we turn off some of those science instruments that aren't able to collect data from that far anymore. And then we come in and we do it again. So we do this, this whole process you see here takes about 10 hours and we go through, we're taking all of this science, all of this data, we're coming in at like five kilometers a second down to 25 kilometers off of the surface of the planet. We are really, or off the moon, we are really zooming by. So we need to be very careful when we steer our spacecraft that we don't crash it into it. And then it takes about 14 days before we come back and do this again. I'm gonna go through that just one more time for us to see it. So we come in, we're about 66,000 kilometers away. We come in, we've adjusted our trajectory. So we're coming in at that five kilometers a second down to about 25 kilometers from the surface, taking all of these high resolution images and other data to store on board. And then when we get so far enough away, we point back towards earth, send all of our data to earth, unload our computer, kind of like resetting its memory so we can collect more. Now, we took high resolution images of the surface to maybe land on it one day. So this is an idea for Europa Lander. Now, this one is not officially set to launch, but NASA did ask us to look into it. Like, if we were to land on the surface and actually test for the real like alien pieces, how would we do it? And this is what we designed. I was part of both of these projects. It's like what we see here is a metal box where we put all of our electronics inside to try and keep it safe from the radiation for as long as we can. Those two things that look like eyes, it's exactly what they are. There are cameras for looking at what we're doing where you see that robotic arm with a saw and a shovel at the end of it where we saw into the ice and then we flip it around. We use our little scoop of a shovel to put it up in that little slot you see on our front of our body, front of the box just to the right of that American flag on the other side of the leg. And those are four legs that come down and stabilize us when we land. Now, it's not a rover. It would not move. It would stay in one place and just have that arm move around. On the back side of those eyes is the antenna. So the circle that looks like a head is our antenna that we would be communicating back to Earth with or potentially another spacecraft that's orbiting Jupiter or Europa above to send information there and then have them relay it all the way back to Earth. So this was not officially going to go, but we're hoping that one day NASA's like, all right, we've seen the greatest things we could possibly see at Europa. Let's get on the surface, get into that ice, see if we can test for life. And then the next step after this would be a submarine. We want to get into that ocean and swim around to see what's down there. Now, just want to share this. I, show, I shared a little bit about how I got into NASA. I did write a whole book on it. You can get it on Amazon, but you don't have to get the book. I'm going to tell you that story right here because some of you may be interested into how you could get into NASA. Well, in high school, you know, something that's going to be in your future, I took as many math and science courses as I could to get ahead. I took summer school math to get ahead. So I went all the way up to calculus in high school and then in technical electives. So you get to choose some of your classes. I chose everything technical or science, technology, engineering, and math that I could. The computer programming and robotics are probably the two biggest things that helped me out. So if you have a choice or an option to take those and you want to get in to science or engineering, especially in the aerospace industry, definitely get some computer programming. And then I also took College courses while I was in high school, like my last year of high school, senior year, I took some college classes since I was ahead because I'm like, if I'm going to be applying for NASA internships or jobs. I want to have as much experience as possible. All right. The journey was long. I'll share a couple challenges with you. I failed a lot as I tried to get into NASA, but I never gave up. It took me three years and over 150 applications to NASA before I got my first NASA internship. And while I was there, I definitely realized I needed to go on and get an advanced degree. So a master's or a PhD instead of just the bachelor's degree that I was working towards. So I'm like, OK, I chose Georgia Tech. It's the only one I wanted to go to. And then Georgia Tech rejected me. They said, we regret to inform you that blah, 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 blah. 
And I was like, dang, well, that's the only place I want to go. So I started talking back and forth with the dean of admissions. And three, three weeks later, about, he brought me into the school. And then I talked to a professor who paid for all of my school. So I went from being rejected from Georgia Tech to getting paid to go to school and get paid to do research with NASA while I was there. And lastly, getting into NASA. I went through three rounds of interviews, but NASA JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab that we've been talking about this whole time, they didn't hire me. I'm like, oh, but I want to work for you. That's all I want to do. So I graduated without a full-time job, but since I was doing research with them, I did get a temporary 10-week internship to prove to them that I belong. So I got that job. I worked really hard. I went around. I knocked on more than 30 doors during that time. I was like, hi, my name's Kevin. I graduated. I'm looking to be hired full time. Can I set up a time to talk with you? And eventually, on the last day of that internship, I became a full time NASA rocket scientist. Now, I share this story to show you how much it took for me to get into NASA, but it's not this hard for everyone. I just share it to show you that if you really want to do it, if you believe in yourself and you are dedicated enough, you can make it happen no matter what. And I stand here as proof of that because NASA wants you no matter what you do. If you have an interest in space, there's a spot for you in NASA. Most of us are scientists and engineers, technicians and mathematics. But look at these posters. Someone had to draw these posters. We have a studio at NASA full of artists and designers, people that are able to craft engaging images and stories to share the amazing science that we're doing with the world. NASA is an organization that needs business, accounting, managers. We also need lawyers. There's a lot of lawyer stuff going on at NASA too. So anything you can think of that you have an interest in, but you would like to be involved in space, there is a spot for you at NASA because like the one in the middle says, we need you because we're going to go to Mars one day. We're looking to maybe in the mid 2030s to the 2050s, you could be the first person to walk on Mars. I'm going to be too old at that point. I'm not going to Mars. I'm just looking to maybe go to space or go to the moon. But if you want to go to Mars, we can make that happen. You just got to be dedicated. You got to try hard and uh, you got to send me a selfie when you get there. Okay. That, that would be the criteria. I want a Mars selfie from you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, if you do have Instagram or social media, you can follow me at Kevin J. DeRune. I talk about space all the time. I know we're going to be asking some questions today, but if I don't get to your question, you can feel free to shoot me a message. I try to answer every single one. I just love to, to talk about space, share it with you. If you got questions about school or careers going forward, like college or applications or any sort of space industry questions, I'm your guy. Awesome. Kevin, thank you so much, man. Honestly, uh, not only do you bring the energy every time, but I will note for our classes, no one is more open about that than Kevin. So if you do want to follow up his website, Instagram, all the amazing platforms, I'll be sharing that all in a resource list at the end. So stay tuned for that email. Uh, we're going to dive in with Q&A in a minute. But first, Kevin, we're going to do our Kahoot together. I don't know if you've done a Kahoot together. If you've ever been involved in one of these. Okay. So I don't think so. Oh, well, you're in for a treat. So four quick questions, everyone. Our game pin okay. is below. Test your understanding. Have a little bit of fun. And what you win is Kevin and I's everlasting respect, which I think is worth quite a bit. So yeah, we're gonna I'm bringing up Kahoot Kevin. myself. You, you can join in on your own Kahoot. Now, I don't want you to win your own Kahoot, though, because I think you're going to know these questions. Okay, gonna, okay. You can, <laughs> you can help us with the answers when we're in the final few seconds of each of these. Um, for any of our students joining for the first time, the faster you answer, the more points you get. And so, uh -huh. especially if you're on YouTube, we'd love to have you like get those answers in quick. I'm going to remove our game pin. It's still on the screen for everybody, but we are going to get underway. And then we're going to Miss Cump's class, joining us in Kansas for our first question after that. Follow me, Beach. You guys are second. Let us dive in together. Oh, Kevin, here we go. I'm I think this is honestly this is like one of the most fun things we get to do in our broadcast every time. All right, three, two, one. Here we go. Oh, wants to work. Here we go. Europa is a key candidate for scientific study because why? Why go there? We talked about this a lot together. Is it because it has animals on the surface? It has an ocean under its icy shell, super close by, like it takes like two days to get there. It's just past our moon, or it's just all over the place. It's flying around the solar system like no one knows what's even going on. Oh. I don't know. That'd be very scary if that was happening. I think only three seconds left. Too. What did we talk about? Yeah, like you go swimming. Oh, it has most of you got this ocean under the shell. 
So I'm going to stress, I'm going to put this in, in that email as well, europa.nasa.gov. Amazing stuff on that site. You can follow along with the mission. Uh, it is the coolest resource. So much to learn there. But Kev, let's check our uh, our leaderboard before we go to question two. Silver Turtle has our lead. Oh, Pretty Silver Turtle. Turtle. Diligent camel. I mean, not real names, not surprisingly. Uh, <laughs> question, question two. Our mission will. Okay. Is it going to send a rover like we have on Mars? We've all seen the rovers on Mars. Is it going to send a robot diver beneath the ice to swim around? That sounds super cool. Is it going to orbit and collect data from space? Or are astronauts going? Are, are, is Kevin going to Europa? Because that would be super cool. Yeah. Send cool. me. I'm ready. Let's go yeah, for you it. You are still ready. I'm ready. I'll join you. Perfect. 20 answers. Okay. What do we got? Our classes. Ooh, a few people thought rovers, but it is just collecting data from space. We want to put a lander there. We That's do, our but next not step. yet. Correct. Not yet. We got to prove that it's super cool, even more than we already know, before yep. we send anything else. These missions are expensive. They're challenging to put together, and you want to really make sure you're getting the most investment uh, out of these incredible journeys. So, yeah, our, we're looking at about $3 billion right now for Europa Clipper, which is a lot of money, but you spread that out over like 10 to 15 years. Question three, with the same leaderboard, it launches next October, which is insane. We've been talking for years, you and I, and it's so exciting that we're like within a year. Ooh. When does it get there? Is it six hours later, six days, six weeks, or six years? Ooh, well, it takes about three days to go to our moon. So if Europa is yep. so far past that, it's probably going to be longer, right? Probably going to be longer. It is six years later. Six years. That's crazy like and yeah. these are these are things going so fast they could like circle the earth in like an hour a little over an hour like it's crazy oh, even, fast. even shorter than that right so the international space station is going at twenty five thousand kilometers an hour it goes around the earth every 90 minutes this thing's going to be going like forty thousand kilometers an hour and it still takes six years space is big it's the biggest space thing we like to highlight space is really big <laughs> it's really big and we also need to like build up speed so we're going to like fly by earth and steal some of its gravity as we go out mm. past it so we have to do a little bit of like dancing in our inner solar system before we can shoot out to the outer solar system to go to jupiter i like that as a phrase for it thank you for that man <laughs> silver <laughs> turtle and diligent camel are still on top look at that it. they really are all right this is a personal question kevin succeeded <laughs> in everything he's ever tried the first time true or false what do we think he's yeah just i'm perfect I'm a, in every way. I'm a genius goat. That's what I am. Yep. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, we highlighted this at the end. Now, it's funny because we bring on people like you and you're so accomplished. You've done so much. But I really like to harp on this point. So I'm hoping we get a lot of, maybe we'll get a bunch of trues. And they'll be like, <laughs> really? They'll really think you're truly. Three trues. Oh, three oh. people. You're like, perfect. But 17 of you, yes. You know, it is a struggle to do amazing things. It's always a challenge. It's important to keep at it. Perseverance is a big part of your life and a big part of your story. And I really thank you for sharing all that with us today, man. Yeah, so. you're welcome. Yeah, sometimes I, I do get it on the first try, but most of the time it's not. All right, Silver Turtle. Third. Ooh, Smart Squid. Ooh. We change it up a little bit at the yeah. end. And number one, by four points. Ooh, with a tie in second and third. Royal Wildcat. We, we Whoa, look at that. Come from behind. Here. Came from behind. I like it. All right. Amazing. Kids, if you are any of those kids, let us know who you are. We'd love to hear from you in the chat. We are going to go to Miss Kump's class. So Miss Kump has been joining us for years. It's always a pleasure to have her class, Kevin. If you guys want to kick us off with a question, we're heading to you. And then we're heading to Miss Michaels right after that. There we okay. are. Miss Kump. Hey, Gremlins. Okay, go ahead. Um, have you ever hit the buzzer in Ninja Warrior? Ooh, Miss Kump. I got one right here. <laughs> I not in competition. No, I've uh, I've made it close. I've made it about halfway through a few times, but I haven't been able to go up and hit that buzzer. Now in practice, so I stopped competing, and now I work with the American Ninja Warrior crew throughout the year, testing out all of those new obstacles you see before they ever go on TV. And when I do that, then I hit the buzzer. But I haven't done it on TV yet. Oh, maybe uh, maybe a couple of years. I, or this year, come on, as soon as you can, it's, man. I'm I can't. About... I'm, I'm, I'm disqualified this year because I know what's happening. I know oh. what the secret obstacles are. Oh, so I have to that's... not know the secret obstacles, put on the blindfold, <laughs> and then I can compete. Okay. We'll figure it out sometime soon, yeah. but it's really cool you get to do it beforehand. That's awesome, man. Um, Avaka West, grade threes. Come on in, Miss Michael. Yes, Go ahead. Hey, Jasmine, you're next. Hey, Jasmine. Hello. If there were aliens, go ahead, Jasmine. 
If there were really Whoa! Green trees! Quiet, guys! Go ahead, really loud. If, if, if there were aliens... Oh, not Jasmine, Natalie. If there were aliens on Europa, would they get damaged by the volcano? Ooh, that is a very good question. If there were aliens on Europa, would they get damaged by the volcano? Possibly. Yeah, we don't know how resilient or how strong the aliens out there would be. So we have tiny little organisms on Earth called extremophiles that are able to survive in volcanoes. And some of them can even survive on the outside of spaceships that are orbiting Earth. So if they're aliens like that, then yeah, they could survive and not be damaged as they go through the volcano. But the volcano could also, also possibly destroy or kill some of those little alien bacteria too. So we won't know until we get out there and try and find them. That is a great question. That is a great question. We've never had anything quite like that before. I like no. that we take animal welfare and now we're applying it to like hypothetical aliens. That's never happened in our history. So thank you, uh, Chaz. Yeah. That was awesome. Folly Beach, we're going to have you guys unmute your mic. Come on in. I'm Mr. Dugan's class. If you guys want to unmute your mic too, we're going to take as many as we can over the next eight minutes together. So let's do it. Hey, Folly Beach. <laughs> Oh, oh I can't hear you. On. Yeah, your mic's on, but it's not coming through. I don't know why. Play with it, type your oh. question in the chat, and then at least we'll be able to take it no matter what, okay? Sorry for the tech trouble. We didn't get a chance to check that because it came in right at the right before we went underway. Oh, no. um, that's okay. YouTubers, feel free to chime in with questions there. Miss Comes Class, we're going to come back to you guys while we're waiting. Uh, and if you've got a second question for us, you're good to go. Hey, okay, I see the, the question from Bowman Beach just come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll take that. Miss Cup, we'll come right back to you. Have you found yeah. alien life on other planets for our YouTube audience that can't see it? Have we found alien life on other planets? No, not yet. We have tried to find life on Mars, but we have not been successful yet. Doesn't mean it's not there. It just means where we've looked, we haven't found it yet. We think the best places to look for life now are the ocean worlds like Europa or Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn or Titan, another moon of Saturn. So we're looking, but not yet. No, I wish no, no, no. that would be great. It would be great. We have a lot of classes seem to think that we have found bacteria, have found life. Trust me, NASA, everyone from NASA and space will be running through the streets, screaming, losing their mind and excitement oh. if we ever find life anywhere. Yes, like, I would, I'd be the first to tell you. Even if I, yeah. I was told I couldn't tell anybody, I would tell you. So, but I don't know. No. Be the greatest scientific discovery of all time. We are all waiting with bated breath. But I will say, Kevin, and this is true of every person we have on that's ever been associated with NASA, every person in the space world thinks there is life elsewhere in the universe. Like it is, space is big. Space is huge. Yeah. It would be really weird if we were the only things out there. And that's why we spend such an effort trying to find life elsewhere. It's a really exciting source of, of joy. Yeah. Yeah. And um, as we bring up the, the next class, I just want to follow up on that is that we have seen that physics, geology, and chemistry work throughout the universe. We see that in other planets and moons and at distant stars, but we have not yet seen biology other than Earth. But once we find biology existing elsewhere, then we believe that life is basically everywhere. We just got to find that first to knock over that domino. It's coming. I certainly hope so. Um, <laughs> Kevin, we're going to go to the Rise Institute in just a minute on our chat, but I'm going to go back to Miss Cumb live for us. Yeah. Um, the Grids class. If you guys want to flick on your mic, I can come to you. You can also share a question in the chat as well. But Gremlins, come on back in. How does the water under the ice not freeze? Ooh, good question. How does the water under the ice not freeze? It comes from the movement of things out at Europa. So remember when we made our fists like this and Europa got bigger and smaller and we went like this and there was friction. So that heat, that helps maintain the liquid underneath the surface. So it's all the movement up there. The other possible thing we don't know entirely for sure is that maybe when it was forming, the iron and rocky core in the center was really, really hot and it might have allowed it all to like melt and it's just been cooling down. So the coldness of space has frozen the outside and then the inside was liquid because maybe way back when it was really hot on the inside. Like our Earth's core is yeah. a molten iron core. It's really, really hot. We don't think that the iron core out at Europa is molten. We think it's hard, solid, like the one at Mars. But if it was molten in the past, that could have been enough to keep it liquid. And then now it's insulated that heat inside. Kind of like when you put I don't have one, like a, like a coffee mug or a, or a koozie on your drink. 
helps to hold in the cold or hold in the heat, like a thermos when you have hot chocolate. Kevin, if our students can find anything in their life that they say with as much energy as you said, molten core, they're set. Like that's your goal in life. Whatever it is, it can be art, science, history, whatever. Just be as excited as Kevin is. That's awesome. Um, six sevens gifted. I'm going to head to you guys live and then rise to dude. I love your questions in the chat. So we're going to take a couple of them, but come on in, Mr. Degree. It's class. Hey guys. Theory. Hi. Um, so I uh, read your, um, uh, about me a little. Mm -hmm. And um, I noticed that you went to South Korea to uh, teach um, in a space camp, I think. Yep. Uh, why did you uh, go to um, South Korea? Uh, so they've been doing this camp. So I go every summer to South Korea to teach. It's at a place called the Song Am Space Center. It is uh, an observatory just north of Seoul, uh, south of the North Korean border. And about 15 years ago, um, one one of the people affiliated with that observatory was going to school in Los Angeles, California, and happened to meet someone who worked at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And they just started a conversation with each other and were like, oh, well, wouldn't it be really cool if like some of the scientists and engineers from JPL came over and taught an English speaking space camp? And that is what birthed uh, this space camp. So they run space camps in Korea all year long at this facility. And then one of them was in Los Angeles, just happened to meet one of the employees at NASA, and they came up with this idea. So now all of the teachers that go, it's a bunch of different people every year, just have some affiliation of working either an intern or works full time at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, yeah, it's one of it is my second favorite thing that I get to do each year after this one, which is number one. Thank you so much, man. Uh, yeah. That is very, very cool. And kudos to our students for going. Uh, again, you've got an amazing website. If people want to find out more about you, check out those books. Check out your YouTube channels. You've got an incredible channel. A place called Space is just one of the many things that you do. Lots of great stuff to keep learning going with, Kevin, when you're done today. So thanks, yeah. uh, guys. That's really nice of you to check into that. Um, yeah. I want to take a YouTube or a StreamYard question. Hanan wants to know, how long was your internship with NASA and what was it like? And a big welcome to our RISE Institute friends joining us today, too. Okay, so I've done two internships with NASA. The first one was in 2012, and that one was four months long. I was at the NASA Langley Research Center in Virginia, and that one I was working with the Center Operations Directorate. What that means is I was helping uh, the, the people in charge of all the different facilities. So in NASA Langley, we have a bunch of wind tunnels all over the place, and we need to maintain those wind tunnels, make sure the buildings are safe because hurricanes come through, there's weather, and there's a lot of movement going on in these wind tunnels. Like That's literally what they are, is moving wind around from anywhere from like 50 miles an hour to thousands of miles per hour. So I was in charge of making sure that those were all safe and good. And then the next internship was with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That was right after I graduated before the full-time job. And that was only 10 weeks long. The summer internships are shorter than fall or spring internships, or we call those co-ops. And when I was doing the 10 week one with JPL, I worked on the Europa Clipper and I was modeling requirements. And what that means is I was taking requirements, which are statements of what our spacecraft has to do, putting them into a computer, kind of like making them into a game, pressing play and making sure that the spacecraft was actually able to play by the rules and uh, see if anything's broken. If anything's broken, then we either got to change the rules or change the spacecraft. Cool. How neat is that? Thank you for going into such detail. We've never had that specific question before. Yeah, these are good ones. I love it. It's so new this year. We could go all day. And that's the problem every time I bring you on is that still yeah. to end sometimes. So <laughs> I'm going to take one more question in a minute with this Michaels group. I want to note, you had this amazing highlight, the fact that there are so many different jobs at NASA and space and beyond. I really can't encourage our kids enough. Check out the Visions of the Future poster series. I think your Europa poster was part of this. Um, yep. But it is like the coolest series ever. I'll link it into that email at the end. And if our kids want to join up with our own James Webb Space Telescope Art Contest, we yeah. got a really cool one on the go right now till October 31st. Submit. Ooh. You can win some amazing books. James Webb prints. It's really awesome. Can't encourage you enough. Um, but, Kevin, I'm going to wrap up with one final question. I'm going to bring in all our kids to say a big thank you and farewell. Avika West, come on in grade threes and take us away. <laughs> how did you make the Hubble telescope? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. How did we make the Hubble telescope? So I personally didn't build the Hubble telescope. I'm too young. That was uh, taken care of before me. But how do we, like, basically how we build a spacecraft is we have teams of, like, a thousand people 
that all design the spacecraft together. They each work on different pieces and parts of it and they come into rooms and then like they make the pieces come together and fit. And then once they design it all on a computer first, then they start to build it and they have to build it in a room that's clean. We call it a clean room. So everyone's wearing like what we call bunny suits. So they're in like white suits and they're going around, they got gloves on to have no, no dirt, no germs. We maintain the humidity and the temperature of these rooms. And then we put the spacecraft together very carefully in the clean room over a really long time. And then even when we have to move the spacecraft from that clean room all the way to the rocket, we got to make sure that it stays clean. So it takes thousands of people to put together the this, this spacecraft on the computer first, all the different pieces, and then we put it all together in a computer. And then we start one piece at a time, putting it together, and we test it along the way too. We don't just build the whole thing and then hope it works. Every step of the way, we put two pieces together, we'll hook up some wires to it, attach it to a computer, run some analysis, click play, see how it works, looks good, okay. Let's do some more, add on some more things, and we'll be doing it in multiple different parts. So they'll build like the front over here, the back over here, and the middle, all building and testing together. And sometimes we'll have the back and the middle connected. It's like, okay, these work together. Cool. Now let's put them together. Let's put them together. So it's kind of like when you're building Legos, if you follow like the instructions in the booklet, one little piece at a time, and you check it over and make sure it's all good to go. And then you add more pieces together. And it's, it's a whole effort. It literally takes thousands of people just to design and build it. And then it takes about 5,000 people to get this thing launched and make sure that it's working successfully. On that James Webb Space Telescope site, the art contest, there's Natalie Ouellette. Yeah. She's the lead outreach scientist for the newer sort of replacement for Hubble that came out. So if you want to learn about that, there's a great video with her on our YouTube channel. Lots to keep learning going. Kevin, always such a pleasure, man. Our kids can check out more about your work on your website, on Instagram. You can go to europa.nasa.gov if you want to follow the Clipper mission and I'll head to the YouTube channel of Place Called Space. So much to go there. It's a really exciting opportunity to learn more. Um, Kevin, I'm going to bring in all the classes to say a big thank you yeah. and lose their minds and farewell. So, Balmy Beach, if you want to flick on your camera, Miss Cumbs class, Avoca West. Yeah. 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 Yeah.